Uh, G11 or G8? G11. G11. Okay. Yeah, Bill. Bill Thomas had a. Uh, I think it was a question about that. Uh oh. Let me see what was that. Oh yeah, he wanted about he he wanted to know about any good or bad experiences. Uh, G11 with the, G8. With the G8 G or G11 uh, Gemini, Los Pandy. No, this is a, a G11 Lost Mandy, not a G8. Right. No bad experiences that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, I know. I've known you. You've had it for quite some time, and I don't think I've ever heard you say a bad word about it. So. No, I just got a gizmo that will um, allow me to uh, take apart the RA and deck, so it's a little easier to lift and transport. Mm -hmm. It's an accessory from uh, Los Mondi. Hey, Al, what's the uh, periodic error on your mount? I don't know. I don't do photography. I just uh, track visually. Yeah, Lou, I can solve all your problems. Get How's a that, Jeremy? Get a daub, then you don't have to worry about periodic error. I had a daub, <laughs> and I sold it, and all my eyepieces are doorstops. Oh. <laughs> you mean they're naglers? They're paperweights. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh oh, I think uh, we went down the rabbit hole on that one. Hey Lou, I have started. a G eleven. I have a G eleven also. Oh, you do? Uh, well, Bill was asking yeah. questions, and I think he uh, disappeared. Yeah, I have a G eleven also. So oh. it's a good mount. It's really good. What's the periodic error on yours, Don? I have never measured it, but. It works really well. Yeah. Although I'll say for the first year, it almost ended up going off the deck a couple of times. It did what? <laughs> I almost threw it over the deck a couple of times. Oh, whoa. It's a, it's a learning, Hello. It's a learning <laughs> curve. It's a yes. real learning curve. But once you got it, it, it is perfect. It, it puts things right in the middle. It's, it's a, built like a tank. It really is. So. How about Dick? What mount do you use, bud? You hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a uh, late model Chinese uh, mount. I forget the name. It's, it has 26 pounds or 28 pounds of carrying capacity. And I, I, it's fine with my C11. Yeah, your images are pretty good. Yeah, well, I, I got around all that complicated stuff by taking one minute exposures. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. You know, it works fine. Uh, my, my, uh, actual opening up between the trees is only about a, a little over an hour, two hours maybe. Oh. A one hour exposure is fine. Yeah. 60 minutes. Sense. I get bored. Yeah. It's mostly the analyzing. 60 minutes of, uh, you know, lots of lots of megapixels each, <laughs> 60 of them. It takes a long time. So I still have a bunch of data I haven't analyzed yet. But I know one of these days I'll get to it. Oh, by the way, I have a question about asteroids. What's a good program? I'm getting disagreement on where Vesta is, which is unbelievable. And I have a, an image of Vesta, and I'm pretty sure it's Vesta because it's not, it's not, it's bright and it's not one of the stars. So who uses uh, SkyMap Pro? Anybody? I do. You do? Do you do asteroids with it? Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I prefer now Sky Safari, quite frankly. Yeah, I, I agree, but SkyMap Pro is such a great program, but yeah. it doesn't seem to handle asteroids correctly. In fact, I, I compared it with the yeah. uh, people in the, in uh, Lowell. Yeah. What's it called? AST. Yeah. Uh, AST. The reality is, I mostly do it through Skyhound, right? Because I do, you know, only when I'm doing session planning, do I want to look at asteroids and stuff. Oh yeah, to look at it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm taking images, and I want to. Yeah. And I, what I do is I compare that where it is with where it's supposed to be. And it's never it's never right. So it's not like your elements are out of date. Well, Maybe. I downloaded them in the, the last week. <laughs> I don't think so. No, it's it, it's something in the program that's not handling it right. Yeah, so it, I've been it, working Vesta, on that. Vesta should be dead on. I mean, this isn't some tiny little. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, Vesta is a well-known object. It's like Mars. <laughs> yeah, we've been following yeah, like it. Lee, what is it? Three fifty or three five five one or whatever? It's it's a fairly substantial. Vesta piece. is number four. Yeah, it's it's a very fairly substantial sized rock. Oh, I don't know what the what that number referred to, but I know it's the fourth asteroid discovered. <laughs> so it's it's right. Well, I'm going to start us up. Great. Um, 
So welcome everybody. And um, this, I think, sort of picks up where you guys were talking before we formally started the meeting. This is from XKCD and is, uh, is just the sort of thing uh, you, when you guys all talk about astrophotography, this is exactly how it strikes me. Um, although your images are fabulous. Um, so uh, let's talk first about what's coming up that we're almost not going to see, and that is the lunar eclipse, which is this Wednesday, May 26th. Um, it will be barely, marginally, almost visible here. Um, the penumbral eclipse begins at 447 a.m. for Philadelphia. The moon sets at 541 and the partial eclipse begins three and a half minutes later. So we won't see that unless you drive very far west, uh, at, meaning leave this air, this state. Totality begins at 711. Um, so you'd have to be on the west coast probably to really appreciate it going back to that earlier slide. Um, totality really is, um, is only going to be caught by you know the second the western two-thirds of the country for the most part but it's there will be a lunar eclipse if you want to catch a penumbra uh, you can catch it at 4 47 in the morning um janet uh rush has taken the laboring ore in scheduling a real live in-person outdoor meeting for the club on Friday, July 23rd at 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at Fort Washington State Park. That's off Joshua Road. Um, we are at the Militia Hill Pavilion, MHL 3. Next to that pavilion, there is a playground. There is a wide open field. Um, it certainly won't be dark by 8.30, but um, you probably can do solar observing if you want, want to. Um, we will open that meeting to the public and, of course, the DVAA members and um, we will probably have a number of member presentations uh, at that presentation and uh, at that meeting, and there will be scopes available. Um, these are a couple of the summer outreach events that are already planned that Jen is already uh, uh, working on. I know Al has a couple of things planned as well. Um, we have star parties June 19th, July 17th, and August 21st. I know the star party coming up is already fully subscribed. It's possible June's already fully subscribed. I think by July, we can probably go back to the old fashioned star party we used to do, but we'll talk about that. Um, and of course, everything's always posted on uh, our website. Uh, a word about the eclipse on June 10th. That's very early in the morning, 5.30. That this is a, solar, a, a partial solar eclipse. Um, the, it is not total anywhere. It's annular where it, it does appear. Um, and Fairview Village is fairly far west of where a lot of our membership is. I know Al Purdy has also found a location in Royersford um, with the permission of a school, the school district, but uh, everybody has to be out of there by 6.30 a.m., but by then there isn't anything to see anyway. Um, I am looking and will continue to look for something closer to the eastern edge of our membership, meaning Belmont Plateau, um, somewhere in the Lurmarine Township area, because I am not traveling an hour at four to catch something at 4.30 in the morning. That's just not the way I roll. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. We have, um, I think it's, it's uh, where, where I, there's so many names in front of me. We have a report uh, from Don about uh, York that's doing a uh, star party. Um, and uh, the, Don was going to tell us about what his plans are for, for a, the York Club. So Elk. we invited him. It was, it was Don, right? Wasn't it, Jeremy? Phil. Phil, I'm sorry. It's you, Phil. Apologies. I get emails from Don all the time, so I get stuff confused. Phil, take it away. Hi. <clears throat> I think you've got uh, about 27 people on the meeting tonight. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you folks. First thing I have to do, though, is clarify nomenclature. When I joined my first astronomy club back in 1994, which was the York County Star, um, York County Astronomical Society, they called their weekly um, invites to the public star watches. They were running the Mason-Dixon Star Party 
And at the time, we could count on about 325 people every year. And I saw that for the first 10 years. At this point, the club has disengaged themselves from the star party. I took over about six years ago. And I find myself in the odd position of calling it the York County Star Party in Lancaster County. And we found a nice little site, a state park that has very little use, but extremely dark skies for this area. Now I've been up to Cherry Springs and I've been down south. I was, you know, I've been around. I know what dark skies look like, but for this neck of the woods, these are fairly dark. The uh, the Star Party has been called the York County Star Party for going on six years now. Last one is in 2019, like everybody else. And I've been holding my breath, discussing things with Jeremy about COVID and trying to figure out when would be a good time to try and safely hold a Star Party. And uh, from the numbers that we're seeing now across the country, I've decided to go ahead and run two star parties, one in September and one in October. And the registration is open, but what you need to know about the star party is that the state parks is allowing us to go on a play field that they never let vehicles go on before. The state park has flush toilets, hot and cold water with an easy walking distance, a dumpster. They've got electricity at the pavilion, which we can use to recharge batteries, but the field is wide open and the maximum allowed vehicle usage on the field at this point is 100 vehicles. And that includes campers. So if somebody has a smaller size camper, it can go on. We have a parking lot with a very good view of the sky that's being used for larger campers and RVs and motorhomes. So within the park, the only camping they allow is group camping. This is not individual camping like your average uh, camping facility. So the other campsites may or may not be used. They have one pole light in the whole place. Speaking with the supervisor last week, he sees nothing that would really prevent any of us to be camping there in September and October, and they just upgraded to all LED lights. Now, to me, that means it's gonna be easier to control the one light they refuse to turn off at this point, which is the pole light, but we can get red filters on everything. They want us there. They're trying to work to get us uh, to the point where we wanna come back. And I've been looking for a place since I started doing the star party back in 1995 that was this good. We've had places, uh, all, some of you have been to some of them. I don't know anybody here who might have been going to the uh, Spring Valley County Park, which was the original site. <clears throat> but I ran the thing in 1995, my second year in the club, I became president and they said, oh yeah, you gotta do this. And uh, the things I consistently heard is find someplace dark, someplace near York County, and we'd like showers. Well, I'm working on the showers thing. But in terms of a star party, this thing is uh, pretty much you own the park when you go in. As far as other star parties, I heard somebody comment that a lot of the Pennsylvania parks, uh, star parties have gone the way of the dinosaur. I don't know. I'm too busy with my own stuff to keep track of all of it. I've got some assistants that do a lot of work in the background. I've got about three, four people that help a lot. I uh, have my own business. I help somebody out with their business and um, you know, I think we all hustle nowadays. There isn't anybody I know, including clients, that doesn't call themselves busy. But in the meantime, if you folks are interested in what we, what I call a star party, it's a group of astronomers from all over the East Coast that show up, some are newbies. And I've been graced with people like Roy Diffriant. I assume you fellas know Roy. I've had uh, people like, um, Jesus, Ken Blackwell down from Virginia, 
bringing up his uh, his big scope. And we've had, honestly, in its heyday, we had people from the UK at the Mason Dixon and from Australia, New Zealand, show up. I guess it was a bigger thing then than I thought it was. But, uh, you know, it was pretty big and I've been struggling to keep it going. When I uh, saw my first party in 1994, I thought it was one of the most amazing things. And I consider it your star party, not mine. Prices are reasonable. <clears throat> Actually, probably cheap. You know, it's uh, 30 bucks for an individual, 45 for a family. And that includes camping from Wednesday to the end. So, you know, we have a food vendor coming at least over the weekend, Friday through Sunday or Monday, depends. He's got a full-time job now. He lost his catering stuff in the market downtown. So he's got to answer to somebody else now. But he gave me a commitment for both star parties and uh, the busy bee is what it's known as. Has anybody here been to our parties in the last couple of years? Does, can, I, can you get a show? Thank you, Jeremy. I already know you. That's how I met you. Don Knob is online. Yeah, I've never been to any of them before, though, no. Well, I appreciate your donations. Yep, but I want to be there this year. And you know, <laughs> that's, that's, I just want to mention, um, I'm just on your website, if you click on the registration, it takes you to last year's registration. So the October, the October party is not even up there yet to register. Well, we didn't have the October. Well, okay, I'll correct it. The fellow that does it okay. is a volunteer. Do you know what that means? Oh yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'll, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'll go in. I'll say it. But you know what? What amazed me is the day after I announced it, I already had somebody register for the September one. I said so. Yeah, I don't see how to register. These are dates that don't make sense if you. Check it out when you have a chance. You know, I'm trying oh, to fix it. That's my weekend project. I've been, but I want, I want to get registered for October because I want to be there. Well, you paid already, didn't you? Yeah, but that was a donation. You can keep that. I'll register <laughs> again. You know, I am I am always surprised at the generosity of the people. Um, we tried moving the Star Party to Kadur State Park one year, and there was this humongous lightning storm that came through and I came in on Saturday morning. I said, look, this is dangerous. We got to get off the field. It was really a terrible storm. People that were camped in the state park said it was the right decision. I canceled the thing. I offered refunds. And the only person that asked for a refund who got there after everybody left and says, this doesn't go well. I got there. Nobody's there. I want my money back. Mm. We had 200 people on the field. Not one other person asked for one. So, you know, I sent it. I didn't say a word. But in the meantime, uh, this is a fun hobby with a lot of great people. And I was so happy I made the decision to start doing this thing. Now, uh, for the club, I ran it for 13 of the 26 years they had it. Um, I've been doing it since about 2015 on my own. And we've had a struggle finding a location. One after another fell through. And I stopped looking west and went <laughs> looking east and found this place at the advice of somebody from the state parks. It looks great, really. Well, I, who spoke that? It was Don. Okay. Well, it's not as big as I'd like. It does have 50 foot pines all the way around, but it is surrounded by Amish farms, the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we had our party in 2019, uh, I was very concerned because we had a solid week, Monday through Friday of rain. During the day, we had fog and clouds almost every night. But like a miracle, the sky would open up. And even with the clouds there, we could see the Milky Way beautifully. And even when the moon came over the trees, and was up at about 30 degrees. You could still see the Mookie, Mil Milky Way there. I was astonished. I'd never seen anything like that in my life, at least not. So, the so Phil, this, um, this uh, Jeremy put a link to the uh, Star Party in the in the uh, chat. Yep. The, the, the event is Saturday, uh, is in September, and is, uh, uh, is and October, or is October a rain date? Oh no! Give me half a second. I ran in here. Uh, just before this happened. Give me about two seconds. Yeah, I, 
Harold, they had planned to do it both months. Okay. Yeah, um, we're planning to go October because September we're going to be at Cherry Springs. Some of us, yeah, that's so. where I'm hoping to be in, in September. Well, we're hoping to be in there August and September. So <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see about Oct we'll see about August. But um, the September party is the week after Cherry Springs or after Black Forest. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's, it's not. Thank we're you not for your patience. We're going to around. I got here. I threw all my stuff in the front hall, including my planner. And um, where the blazes are you? Well, I'm looking. I'm looking at the website. Yeah, that's not accurate. September that's 8th to 12th, and October 6th to 10th. That's correct. And there's link. There's a link to join the group, and there's a link for the GPS and uh, all the information you need. Um, you got it. And a website and an email address for you, Phil. I appreciate that. Anything else on the uh, on that? Because I want we have other reports and I don't want to keep no, our guests. I don't want to hog your time. You've forever. got it. Just only you. fix the registration because that's not up to date. OK, no, I'll take care of it. Thank you for thanks. letting me know. All right, thanks. And thank thanks. you very much for your time, everybody. And thanks right. for coming and telling us Here. about that. Before he disappears. Yep. <laughs> 100 is the 100 cars limit? Yes, I worked that out with them. The vehicles is what they were concerned about. If you carpool, we can get more in and there's a lot of room in the RV parking area. Awesome, that, so we might wanna have a, a conversation with our group about that. If point. you can carpool, that would be awesome. The more the merrier. Excellent, thank you. Um, that actually looks like it might be a, a good option. Um, Thank you very much. It doesn't require a five hour drive either. Um, so um, let's see, let's then go with our uh, committee and officer reports. And I always go in the order in which we used to do them in Radnor, which may not be that far away before we return. So Brian, you're up. We have uh, six new members this month. Wow. Um, so yeah, we keep, we keep gaining. I, I, I find it astonishing. Uh, Daniel Stern. Uh, Matt Chapin, uh, Matt Gay, and uh, Katrina Comber, uh, Angelo uh, Zuletti, and uh, Daniel uh, Loftus. So uh, I don't know if I saw any more uh, of those uh, people tonight, but uh, welcome. That's great. Very good. Excellent. And now from our esteemed treasurer, Lewis. Uh, I don't know how much steam the treasurer has, but thank you very much. Uh, so that's 177 people. Uh, for those of you who have a historical bent, that is very, very near the high of my 12-year tenure here, right? So uh, maybe 13-year tenure. Uh, so good on us. Um, so just two things. I don't want to talk about treasurer. Obviously, sign up if you, you owe us. Uh, you need to be a, a member. It helps us in our mission, which is doing great programs like this today. Um, the website is a great, great resource. And but for those of you still having problems, remember there's a support link that you can get live human support, how to access the website, work with the website, and, and so forth. And then the last thing is, uh, you know, our club runs on volunteers. Uh, a lot of them are, are here all, here today, but uh, you know, it's all we could always use more. Let me just leave it as that. Thanks, Lewis. And and speaking of volunteers, I just I want to shout out again. The editors of our newsletter are absolutely amazing. Um, this year we've been sort of it's been an editorial editor by committee, and they've been rotating who's taking the laboring or the, the uh, running the show each month. And every issue just it, it amazes me. Every issue is greater than the one before. So um, I'm looking forward to the next. Um, I'm looking forward to the next uh, next newsletter issue, which will come out in the very near future. Um, Lewis, I, Lou, I understand you have a question. I, I don't want to sidetrack us. Is it quick? Lou? Lou Are you talking to Lou? me or Lou? Yes, yes, you, Lou Varvarises. No, I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a uh, ask. Well, I wanted to know if anybody would be interested in another um another series of um, workshops on Pix Insight. I was getting ready to prepare something, but if 
uh, we're not going to have that many people interested, I might shift gears to something that's, uh, you know, uh, more useful. So, may, may I make the phone? Any, may I make the phone? Well, people have their video off, Lou. May I make the following suggestion? Put a small notice together and send it to Dana, who is running the newsletter this month, and she can put it in the newsletter, and you'll see if anybody bites at the notice there. You could also float it on the listserv, or, and if you want, you can send me an email, and I'll put it out across the club right. email through so the website. If anybody has any ideas for any kind of workshop, you know, write it down, and we'll see what we can do to work on it. Great. And now we come to the uh, observing part of our meeting, and that would be Andrew, who's... So, Andrew, I know you have an observing report. I'm looking forward to what you have. All right, great. Thanks, Harold. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right, so uh, is there any new members tonight? My name is Andrew Hitchner. I'm the observing chair for the DBA. Uh, and this is the monthly observing report for May 2021. Uh, before we get into it, though, I do want to remind everyone um, we do have a star party tomorrow. Uh, it's it's not looking good, uh, but weirder things have happened. So uh, it is it is tomorrow at Valley Forge. We are doing the station setup again. So please do not bring your scopes. Uh, and I just want to say thanks again to uh, to Gary and Wayne and and all of you who who help out at the star party with this uh, new format that we're doing. Uh, I think it's really great, and there's there's going to be opportunities for us to use it even past the pandemic, uh, even when we return to normal, if you will. So, so thanks to all you guys. Um, okay, so uh, Harold did a great intro uh, about my topic today, about the lunar eclipse. And, uh, and Harold, you know, he showed that graph with like where you're gonna see it and all, um, but he didn't go into too many details about the terms and what's on the graph. So, so, uh, so good job, Harold. I, I wanna make this illusion that we planned this stuff. So just, just roll with it, okay? So, um, but no, I'm, I'm going to take this like general uh, lunar eclipse observing um, topic kind of and go a little bit deeper on what those things were, like the P1s and the U1s and like penumbral and all of that. So, uh, so jumping right in. Uh, so what is a lunar eclipse? So a lunar eclipse is when the moon moves into the Earth's shadow. So for that to occur, the Earth needs to be between the sun and the moon. Uh, and it also happens on the night of a full moon. So the full moon. Uh, this month is May 26th. Now, uh, there are different types and lengths of, of lunar eclipses, and it all depends on the position of the moon in its orbit, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, now, lunar eclipses are great because they last a lot longer than solar eclipses. Uh, they can last up to two hours or so, and that's just because the Earth's um, shadow is a lot bigger. Um, so it can last a pretty long time, and it's perfectly safe to view with no eye protection. It's even um, perfect with, with no scope, which is the unaided eye, or with scopes and all. So that's a little nice that you don't need to really plan too much to observe. So what are different types of lunar eclipses? So before I explain that, I do want to explain um, a little bit about shadows. So the Earth's shadow, or shadows in general, all shadows have two parts. Um, the umbra, which is the innermost, the darkest part of the shadow, and then the penumbra is um, where only a portion of the light gets obscured. So uh, it's a little fuzzy part. If you go outside um, noon tomorrow, maybe not tomorrow because it's going to be overcast, but if you go when the sun's out, look at your shadow. Um, the umbra is going to be the dark outline, and then you'll see a little fuzzy part around it, and that's the penumbra. So the Earth does a similar thing. So uh, Harold mentioned the penumbra lunar eclipse, and that's what we will see. And that's when the moon falls within the penumbra of Earth's shadow. Uh, now, some people say, oh, well, that's a partial eclipse, right? And it's like, not technically. There can be total penumbral eclipses when the moon never goes into the umbra anyway, no matter where you are. Um, so that isn't a partial eclipse. That is a total penumbral eclipse. Uh, but those are pretty rare. And what we think of as a lunar eclipse, um, a total lunar eclipse is an umbral lunar eclipse. Now there can be partial lunar eclipses where only a portion of the moon falls within the umbra. And then we also have total lunar eclipses when the entire moon falls within the umbra. And then we get that blood moon effect or the reddish hue, copperish hue onto the moon. 
so here's a little diagram that I found um, to illustrate this. So first off, this, this inner portion here, the darker gray area is the umbra, the darkest part of the Earth's shadow. And this outer gray portion, lighter gray portion is the pendant. So on the extremes here, you know, when, when the Earth doesn't cross through either, then we have no eclipse, right? Just an average full moon. Um, if the Earth or if the moon just goes through the um, penumbra, then we have this partial or penumbral eclipse here. And then if the moon goes through the penumbra and into the umbra, then we have a total or umbral eclipse. Now, a thing to, to remember when you're looking at this graph is that um, the Earth is also rotating, right, in the day-night cycle. So uh, it can all, it's all about timing, right? So in the case of us on May 26th, the moon is going to be setting while it's going through the penumbra. So while in some areas it will cross into the umbral, by then the moon will have set. So for us, we're only going to see something around here where it's only going to go into the penumbra. So for us, the penumbral eclipse. So um, those are different types of eclipses and each eclipse uh, can be described in these kinds of phases. And it's actually really similar to transits as well. A lot of these will, if, if you're familiar with how transits work in eclipses, there's a lot of overlap between them. So um, I have this graph down here with the P1s, mid, U2s, and you might've remembered these from the graphic that Harold showed. Uh, and these correlate to uh, this first column over here and also with their names on here. And I'll just walk through them really quickly. So we have P1 here where the edge of the moon first makes contact with the penumbra of the Earth's shadow. So that is first contact, P1. Then we have U2 where the entire moon is in the umbra and the Earth, the moon first touches the Earth's umbra. And it, this graph is a little misleading because the, the moon, won't be touching the edge of the penumbra at the same time it makes contact with the umbra, just, just to note that. Um, but second contact is when the moon touches the umbra of the Earth. Third contact is when the moon surfaces entirely within the umbra. So when this far side or far edge of the moon finally crosses into the umbra and the entire thing is The greatest eclipse is when the moon is at the center of the umbra. And then we can work backwards. I won't go through each one exhaustively, but then we have fourth contact where it's exiting the umbra. We have fifth contact where um, we're touching the penumbra exiting. And then we have sixth contact when the, Earth is, the Earth's penumbra is no longer in contact with the moon. So, uh, so this is just showing that, you know, there's, there's different phases of the eclipse. And it also equates to that graphic, which I'll show a little bit later. So I mentioned that the orbit of the moon also relates to the timing of lunar eclipse. And while lunar eclipses can last really long, uh, it does depend on where the moon is in its orbit. So that's determined by the relative distance between the Earth and the moon. So remember, the orbit of the moon is an ellipse, um, thanks to Mr. Kepler and his first law, which defines that. And because it's an ellipse, uh, we have these things called apogees and perigees. So apogee is when the moon is at its furthest distance from the Earth. This is also when the orbit speed is its slowest because its gravitational um, force with the Earth isn't at its strongest then. So we have a longer duration because it's taking a little longer um, to pass through the Earth's shadow. And then on the opposite side, we have perigee where we have the shortest distance from the Earth and the moon. The orbit speed is its fastest. It's whipping around the Earth, right? Because the um, gravitational pull is a little stronger there. And it's also the shortest duration because it takes a little, it goes through the Earth's shadow a little. Uh, if you ever have a um, problem remembering these, uh, I always explain it to people at the observatory, Perry, if you think of periscope, right, which is a telescope, it brings things close to you. So perigee is the closest axis on that ellipse. A little trick there. So I mentioned the blood moon and, and this does take a little bit um, or it does deserve its own topic here. So unlike the solar eclipse, right, um, the moon never fully darkens during the lunar eclipse. Uh, it's actually really pretty. Uh, due to the Earth's atmosphere, some light does get into the umbra, and this is um, the light getting bent around the Earth um, as it goes through its atmosphere, and this is called refraction. Now, um, shorter wavelengths 
or a blue light will be scattered out of the path and will not make it into the umbra. However, longer wavelengths or red light will fall into the umbra and then eventually onto the moon. And then this gives the moon a reddish or some people say cockfish hue. And some people like to call it the blood moon or so. There's a, there's a lot of cultural, if you're interested in the cultural, um, uh, in the history of it, then I, I recommend you look into it. It's pretty fascinating. There's a good Wikipedia article on it. But um, and this is kind of interesting because the, the reddish hue does depend on what is in the atmosphere at the time. Uh, so the people have linked things like volcanic eruptions when uh, the atmosphere is a little thicker. There's these larger sized particles in the atmosphere uh, can make the lunar surface a little more red during uh, a lunar eclipse. So now uh, there have been some volcanic activity over the past few months um, around the Earth. So I don't know if um, the ones in like Indonesia will reach all the way around here, but, but maybe, um, although you'll have to drive a little bit more west, as Harold mentioned, to see it, so. And then here's just a nice graphic. Um, I, showed you, I showed you drawings and things, but here's a nice picture of what's happening. Uh, so if we start up here, um, so the Earth now, as you look at it, is in the penumbra. It's not really dark, though, um, because again, a, a significant amount of light is still getting in the penumbra. And then here you can see the umbra starting to creep onto the earth, onto the moon. And then more portion of the umbra or more of the moon is in the umbra. And then almost here, we almost are at total eclipse or um, maximum eclipse. And then uh, here you can see right down here when the moon is totally in the umbra, it's getting that reddish hue, that blood moon. And then as it moves out again, you can see the umbra creep back. And the reason this is happening um, is because right here, there's less scattered light as it exits the umbra. So it's not gonna be as red, it's gonna be a little bit darker then. And then eventually the moon returns to its full brightness. So a little more about the May 26th event, and you've seen this before, but now you know a little more about it, right? Uh, you know what these, uh, you know, these letters are here. And I didn't really like this graph, although it's, it's the best one I could find is like an image. Um, I would have reversed these colors having the dark portion where all of the eclipse is visible, but besides the point. Um, so the entire eclipse will be visible, unfortunately, in most of the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. But if you relate these back to the um, graphic that I showed earlier, so U1 and P1, then we will be uh, right in between here. We'll be right in between first contact and second. And unfortunately for us, because of the timing of the eclipse, the moon will have set. Um, and that's why we can't see the entire event. Uh, but if you if you can get to the edge of California or out into Hawaii or something by May 26, you'll be able to see the whole thing. So start planning in. And Harold showed this a little bit, but I'll show it to you again. So from the East Coast, uh, the penumbral eclipse will start at 4.47 a.m. The maximum eclipse will start at 5.30, and I don't want you to get confused with the greatest eclipse. This is just the most portion of the eclipse that we will see. It is the moon will not, the greatest eclipse is when the moon is in the middle of the umbra of the earth. We will not see that. This maximum eclipse is the most amount of the eclipse that we will see. So that's happening at 5.30 a.m. Then unfortunately the moon's gonna set right after that. So, um, but it, it, it can still be cool. Uh, I don't know if, we'll really be able to see too much dimming. Um, although if you have a camera and you're trying to take pictures, you might notice uh, something out there, but you won't be seeing like the dark ombre moving across the earth. So, uh, and that is all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I, we worked just the way we rehearsed it. Good job. Um, uh, a couple of uh, months ago, I get four or five months ago, I was reading a fascinating article. I think it was in space.com or might have been astronomy about that raised an issue that um, Andrew Weir touched on in his novel Artemis. Uh, in Artemis, for those of you who, who haven't read it, the landing sites for the Apollo astronauts are preserved. They're considered sacred or um, untouchable or almost as though they are private property. And um, this, the writer of the article talked about, it raised the question of whether 
um, there were certain property interests in aspects of the moon um, really made me think about, you know, be, made me think about the lunar surface in a different way. Um, the, the fact that it was written by a law professor also really appealed to me. And I reached out and uh, Professor Hanlon has joined us tonight, and I'm very excited to hear her thoughts on this sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to give give the floor to Jeremy to introduce Michelle Hanlon, and I'm really looking forward to what you have to offer us tonight. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Harold. I'll start with a little uh, introduction. I first had a comment for uh, Andrew. Uh, if something bothers you, but only very slightly, can you take pen umbrage to it? All right, a little highbrow. Humor. All right. Oh, oh. All right. All right, a little uh, preview of some uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, next month, uh, we're going to have Liz Landau, who's a NASA senior communication specialist, and she's going to talk about life beyond Earth, where, how, and why. Uh, in July, as Harold said, uh, we're going to have an indoor out, uh, out, or sorry, outdoor in-person meeting. So that will maybe be our first uh, return to uh, in-person meetings. And that'll be an astronomy fair that uh, Jan is putting together. I'm sure it'll be great. And uh, looking a little further ahead, on August 19 through 21 will be the annual Astronomical League convention. That's a, a nationwide event. It's called ALCON. Uh, as far as I know, registration is free. At least I was able to register and they didn't uh, bill me for it. So it looks like it'll be free. And that'll be that weekend of August 19 through 21. And they have some really uh, big name speakers there. So that'll be something you'll definitely want to uh, check out. Okay, so now for uh, tonight's presentation, I'll uh, remind everyone that uh, if you are not the invited speaker, uh, please uh, turn off your camera to save some bandwidth and uh, mute your mic to uh, keep the, uh, the noise low. So tonight we're happy to uh, welcome Michelle Hanlon. So Michelle is an air and space law instructor, which is, uh, I didn't even know that existed, but she's an air and space law instructor and a research counsel at the University of Mississippi School of Law. So she's joining us uh, from Mississippi uh, by the magic of Zoom. Uh, Michelle got her BA from Yale, uh, JD from uh, Georgetown, and an LLM from McGill University up in uh, Quebec. Uh, she's the president and co-founder for uh, an organization called For All Moonkind, which is about protecting human cultural heritage in space. Uh, she serves on the board of a number of startups involved in uh, commercial space activities. And she's also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Space Law. So please join me in welcoming Michelle Hanlon. Jeremy, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. And Harold, thank you for that introduction as well. I really appreciate it. I um, I like to say I'm a, I'm a space lawyer. The air part just slips in because I have to teach aviation law so that um, right now our students can get jobs in aviation a little bit easier than they can get them in space right now. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I, um, what I, what I, decided to, what we talked about doing was talking more about sort of an introduction to space law. Um, my, my um, as, as Jeremy said, um, I am the co-director at the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, um, where we're really focused on commercial space, supporting commercial space, and looking at the laws that we need to assure that human communities in space uh, are successful and sustainable. So thinking about what kind of laws we need in place now, how we can support commercial space and how we're gonna get humans off of our earth and into space successfully. Um, and I'm also the co-founder and president of For All Moonkind. Um, as Jeremy said, we are the only organization in the world committed to protecting heritage in outer space. And as Harold mentioned, you know, think about those Apollo lunar landing sites. Um, there is nothing that protects them. There is no heritage convention for space right now. For All Moonkind um, is, an, like you all, we're an entirely volunteer organization. Um, we're made up of, of lawyers from all over the world um, and, and uh, scientists from all over the world talking about not just how, from a legal standpoint, we can protect not just the Apollo sites. There's 110 sites on the moon um, with stuff, human-made stuff on them. 
what needs to be protected, what needs to pre be preserved, how we're gonna do it legally and how we're gonna do it physically. Uh, I'm also the president of the National Space Society. Um, the National Space Society is a citizens advocacy organization. Um, the mission and focus is to promote human communities beyond earth. Um, and so if you're interested in that, I really encourage you to join NSS. We have a lot of really interesting programming. Um, and one of my focus is really bringing the, it's, it's been focused very much on sort of technical aspects and we're realizing now we need to spin a little bit and really think about the policy because um, right now the technology is way ahead of our, of, of law. Um, I wanna start, um, I'm, I love history, I love space history. I'm gonna start with this picture of the feather on the moon um, because we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15. Um, and so again, this is like one of the sites we want to uh, protect and save. It would, the feather probably is disintegrated by now, but it sure would be nice to protect it and preserve it if it's not. So I'm, now moving to the present, I wanna talk about, I would sort of put you in the frame of mind and think about why we need space law and what we're talking about when we're talking about space law. So what's happened recently? China landed on Mars. You know, if you live, you guys live pretty close to DC, um, you know, a lot of senators and, and uh, legislators are saying, oh, this means, you know, China, Chinese hegemony on, in space and they're, they're, this new space race and so forth. But in this, think about that context, you know, it's a, it's space is political and it's still very much like the, you know, the reason we got to the moon was because of the race with Russia and we wanted the Soviet Union and we wanted to, there was politics on earth that affected what we do in space. Um, just last year, um, Elon Musk uh, wrote in his Starlink contracts that um, if you are using his services on Mars, that uh, US laws do not apply, that he was basically declaring uh, Mars is free and we don't have to abide by US law and we'll make, when we get to Mars, we'll make our own law. And of course this caused great consternation amongst space lawyers because, oh, how can he do that? But you know, can he do that? Of course he can do that because he did it. The question is, what does it mean under, under the law? Um, perhaps a little bit more um, of interest to this group is Starlink and dark skies. What does Starlink mean um, if you can see it on orbit? Is it going to prevent um, good science and good astronomy from Earth? And how, who, how do we regulate that? And how are we going to prevent and the entire night sky being peppered or, or sprinkled like this with small satellites? And of course, um, this just a couple months ago, we started talking about space tourism. We have two private space crews going up, one with space, uh, one on Crew Dragon and one with Axiom Space. And so we need to start thinking about tourists in space and, and how are, what kinds of contracts do these people have? Axiom wants to build a hotel in space. So what does that mean? Who's gonna, how do you, what labor laws do you bring to space with you? Do, we, do humans have a right to oxygen in space? You know, they don't have a right to oxygen on earth because nobody can prevent you from getting it. That would be murder. Um, but, but then in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, you don't say we have a right to uh, oxygen. So what does that mean in space? Um, and finally, we have Artemis, the Artemis program, putting the first woman and the 13th man on the moon. Um, of course, from, a, from the standpoint of uh, NASA, um, going back to the moon is really important. Um, for space lawyers, we're nerded out over what are, are called the Artemis Accords. Um, all these nations, plus the Ukraine and now South Korea, have signed these accords. And as, we, as I take you through space law, you'll, um, you'll see why it's so important. Um, so why space law? Um, we talk about what, why do we even care? Um, many of the conveniences humans enjoy today are supplied directly by or with support of satellites that are now crowding our orbit. Technological advancements have catapulted more and more states and private entities into realms once monopolized by two dominant spacefaring nations. So it's really interesting about space. It's a lot like cyber. What we're seeing in the cyber world is now individuals and commercial entities can do things that once only nations could do. So we're looking at a very different kind of law. How do you regulate something so massive? Um, more and more entities are looking realistically at extracting uh, resources from space. So think space mining and you think about, you know, private property in space, can you own it? Um, do you own it if you mind it? Um, the space tourism industry we talked about and um, are the Artemis, Artemis program is not the only program on earth thinking about returning humans to the moon. The Chinese have a program, the uh, Russians have a program. A lot of other countries and individuals and companies are looking at 
going back to the moon and, and building permanent settlements and habitats on the moon. And of course we have militarization of space. We have Space Force in the US, in France, in Russia, in China, and many other countries building this Space Force to protect not, not you know, ultimately humans in space, but really think about all of the assets in space that we need to worry about protecting. Um, I, the, uh, the other reason we need to, um, we, why space in general is because a lot of what we do in space um, has terrestrial applications. Um, and so there's a, uh, NASA does this, what's called a spin-off magazine um, and just talks about all of the things, benefits we have gotten from space to help at, um, to better our lives here on earth. So things like pacemakers and, and so forth. Um, and space is good business. You know, the, in 2017, the total global space economy amounted to $348 billion, 79% of which were commercial revenues. Um, <clears throat> and it grew by 30.5% in 2017. Um, and Morgan Stanley's space team estimates that roughly the, uh, it will be $350 billion global space industry. So we're not, there are not a lot of space lawyers out there right now, but clearly space is gonna need, uh, need a lot of lawyers. So that's a very long introduction to, okay, what, what exactly is space law? What are we talking about? So when I started, I said, you know, the, we're now starting to see um, individuals and commercial entities doing what nations before only did. But space law is about those nations because when space law was formed, we were thinking only about nations doing things. So international law is basically this general consent of states. Um, when we look at international law, we're looking at treaties and so forth. And then we're talking about state responsibility. Um, and state responsibility means meeting your obligations, meeting your legal duties. So we have on earth, even without treaties, we have sort of this sense of uh, obligation between nations. Um, that obligation travels into any activity that a nation does, um, but it was unclear, does it, does it travel to space? What does space look like? So one of the first questions was, well, um, who owns space? Like what, what happens? We know that here on earth, when you, um, when you fly an airplane over a territory, you can't, right? You need permission to do that. Um, and we have an entire multiple conventions that govern how airplanes can travel over other countries. Um, so in 1957, uh, the, the Soviet Union sent Sputnik up and nobody complained. Nobody said, hey, wait, you can't. Um, send a satellite over the space above my airspace. And so we, we had what was called uh, sort of instant customary international law. Because Sputnik was, went around the earth and because none of the nations that complained of, uh, not, that over which it flew complained about it, um, we, we determined the international community, we humans said, okay, space um, cannot be claimed by any sovereign. Um, and so you can't say um, all of the space from here to eternity above the United States belong to the, belongs to the United States. Um, I did also wanna say, um, so in 1957, um, Sputnik went around, we created this sort of understanding that space is um, non-sovereign, not, not the territory of anybody. In 1959, we created the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It meets in Vienna now. Um, and the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. So all of the laws that we are gonna talk about came out of this Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which was, lit which was formed literally as soon as we understood that space was gonna become a realm of humanity. And uh, President Eisenhower really pushed for the formation of this committee um, and the Soviet Union agreed because the one thing that everybody understood was that they wanted space to be peaceful. Nobody wanted uh, bombs raining down from satellites in space. So this is the body of space law um, and it's not much. This is literally all of the laws we have about space at an international level. Um, you'll see from the Outer Space Treaty, which is really the one I'm gonna focus on, um, why we have uh, laws at a national level, but this is our Outer Space Treaty regime. Um, the Moon Agreement of 1984 is, uh, has only been ratified by 18 nations, but the Outer Space Treaty, which is the Magna Carta of space, um, has been ratified by 111 nations. So uh, definitely the majority of countries on earth. So it's uh, officially called the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. So what does that mean? What's important about that? 
That means this, these are just principles governing the activities of states. So we're not talking about individual people, we're not talking about private companies, and we're also just talking about principles. These are not, uh, these are not laws like thou shalt not or thou shalt. These are, these are just, we will go, we will uh, explore space with these general principles in mind. So Article 1 captures what we just talked about with Sputnik. The um, space is free for expo exploration and use by all states. Um, every state will have free access. Space is the province of all humankind. Um, and there should be freedom of scientific investigation and encourage international co cooperation. So this is the, these are the guiding principles of everything we think about with space. And so when you think about can you own property in space, you got to remember um, under the Outer Space Treaty, free for exploration and use by all states, free access to all areas. Fundamentally, though, there's an even, you know, what I, what I want to sort of convey in this um, presentation is we do have these guidelines and principles, but they leave a lot of gaps. And that's why um, space law is so important right now, because as we get closer and as we use space more and get closer to having human communities in space, we really need to address these gaps. So one of the biggest gaps is that we don't agree where space begins and where Earth's atmosphere ends. There's not one, we have not reached agreement. It is discussed and debated every single year at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space meeting. Um, some states say it's a hundred kilometers. Some states say, well, no, it shouldn't be just an arbitrary number. It should be decided based on what, uh, what you're doing, what your uh, aircraft or spacecraft, what it is intended to do. Um, but we don't have international agreement on where space begins. And also the, um, in the United States has announced that it does not view space as a global commons. So if you saw, if you recall, the Outer Space Treaty says um, the uh, Article One, uh, space is the province of all humankind. And there are a lot of countries that wanna make space a global commons the way we deal with the high seas. The United States has never, not one single president of the United States has ever, um, has ever thought of space as a global commons. This is a very strong US position. It is not a global commons because of this concern when, when the concept of global commons was, um, was debated at the UN level, um, there were the sort of this, this socialist communist view versus more of, a, more of a capitalist view. And this, the global commons, that legal concept has this baggage with it that says, um, well, if you, if you view it as a global commons, then you have to share everything about it. And that's something that the United States um, won't do. So we said also that the exploration and use of space shall be free for all. So what does that mean, you know, just in orbit? Well, um, we all, we have remote sensing um, satellites, right? And so earth observation satellites look down and can um, photograph, can watch, can see any place on earth, regardless of territorial boundaries. And a lot of, a lot of states, a lot of developing states said, that's not fair. I don't want you taking pictures of my of my land, of my territory from space. And the developed countries said, well, no, space is free for uh, exploration and use by all. So the Outer Space Treaty says we can use space even if it is to invade your privacy and to invade your territory with our cameras. And this was debated in the United Nations for about 25 years. Um, ultimately, the, uh, the spacefaring nations uh, won, if you will. Um, and we've decided that Freedom of use and exploration means that you can send your satellite anywhere you want over any part on Earth. And we know uh, it's in, whether it's, as long as it's in space, wherever that is, um, nobody else can shoot it down, nobody else can complain. And so that's why we have spy satellites, you know? Um, so these, these things that look like um, marshmallows, this is a, um, a US Earth observation satellite photographing uh, Russian military exercises. Um, perfectly legal. If you were flying a plane, the plane could be shot down. But since you're on a satellite um, above uh, in orbit, this is perfectly legal. Um, of course, we have also seen this is, um, um, I just totally blanked on the name, um, Area 51. Um, so the United States certainly has a lot of, uh, has laws about what you can take photographs in the United States. 
um, and how do we apply those and enforce those with other countries? We enter into treaties where we say, yeah, your satellite's gonna go over uh, this property, but please don't share images of this or um, a, a, a similar things like that. So the reality though, is when you think about it, um, we're not gonna be able to make treaties like this with every single country in the world as they start to get more and more capability um, with earth observation. And as we've seen earth observation becoming um, cheaper and cheaper with smaller satellites. So we're gonna have to figure out different ways to deal with this in national security and with privacy. Um, Article two of the Outer Space Treaty is hotly debated um, today. Um, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation or by any other means. So what does that mean? You can't go up and plant your flag on the moon and say this belongs to the United States. Um, okay, but um, national appropriation by any other means, that also means that we can't go up and make the Apollo Lunar Landing Sites US national parks because that's a claim of sovereignty. Um, what does it mean in terms of what if you have your property there, you've built a base or a mining operation, um, can you extract the resources? So here's another gap. Stephen Grove, uh, a, uh, one of the world's first space lawyers, says it appears to contain no prohibition regarding individual appropriation. So it says no, no, no state may um, claim territory by sovereignty. So can a private individual, can a commercial individual do that? Um, and the phrase and uh, the moon and other cel celestial bodies could be interpreted as just meaning the entire moon or the entire celestial body. So you can't claim the whole moon, but maybe you can claim a part of it. Um, and what if you extract resources from the moon or something else, then you're not really claiming territory. Can you use those resources? Well, the United States interprets article two to say, yes, you can. President Obama in 2015 signed the Asteroid Act, which says any resources obtained in, in outer space are the property of the uh, entity that obtained them. If you mine it, you own it, is the US position. And this is why the Artemis Accords are so important because that is uh, that position is, is a part of the Artemis Accords. And the more nations that we can get to uh, join us in the Artemis Accords will support this concept. This, um, this idea that you mine it, you own it is already um, has been also uh, passed in, by law in Luxembourg and UAE. So you think about that, two tiny little countries um, are, are taking the position that if you mine it, you own it. Why are they doing that? Because they want to attract space business. So if you're licensed in the United States or Luxembourg or UAE, um, your government's gonna support your claim that you can take those resources, mine them, use them and profit from them. Um, Article three says that um, outer space, uh, the international law applies in space. Um, and so again, things like the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights will apply in space. Um, so space is definitely not Lawless. Article four are the um, are the peaceful purposes, the military provisions. Um, probably be comforted to know um, that you cannot um, place nuclear weapons or any other kinds of WMD in space. This was the fundamental point that President Eisenhower wanted to make um, when he suggested that we start negotiating. That position was uh, further um, strengthened by President Johnson. Um, so no nuclear weapons or any weapons of mass destruction in space. What does it not say? It doesn't say you can't put conventional weapons up in space, concerning a lot of people. It doesn't say you can't shoot a satellite down from Earth. This is concerning a lot of people. Um, the moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all states exclusively for peaceful purposes. So notice again here, the moon and other celestial bodies have to be used for peaceful purposes. It doesn't say outer space needs to be. And so I like to compare the Antarctic Treaty with the Outer Space Treaty here. And you see the difference and, and how the negotiation went a little bit differently. Antarctica, the whole of Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. Well, nobody wanted to say the whole of space um, should be peaceful purposes only. So we the negotiators limited it to the moon and other celestial bodies. Then uh, in the Antarctic Treaty, there shall be prohib prohibited any measures of a military nature, period. Um, on the moon or other celestial bodies, um, you can't establish um, military bases or conduct military um, maneuvers, but you can have military personnel doing those things. So see the little difference there. The, the, 
the peace, the concept that space should be used exclusively for peaceful purposes has some gaps in it. And so everybody always asks me, oh, so is, is Space Force, is that illegal? Um, it's, people have written that it's a violation of international law. It's not a violation of international law. I don't, what, what is a violation of international law is putting uh, nuclear weapons or WMD in, in orbit um, or establishing a military base on another planet or the moon. Um, having a space force that is out to figure out ways to protect um, satellite operations that is, that is honestly just common sense. Article five is a uh, uh, return and rescue um, that it basically says that all astronauts are um, envoys of uh, humankind. And so if you see an astronaut in distress, then you must, you are obligated, literally obligated to rescue them or give them whatever aid that they need. This is a really interesting article um, now because space tourists are not called astronauts in the United States. They're called spaceflight participants. So what does that mean? And again, I know that non-lawyers kind of probably roll their eyes, but words are important. So what does it mean if you're a spaceflight participant and not an astronaut? Even if you called space tourists astronauts, who was gonna pay if you have an obligation to protect and rescue those astronauts? So think about that first slide I showed you, one of the first slides I showed you where we have four, um, individuals, private individuals, non-government individuals flying on space, SpaceX Crew Dragon, what if something goes wrong? How much is it gonna cost to rescue them? Think about the cost of the launch to rescue them. Who bears the burden of that cost? Is it the American taxpayer? What kind of, so what kind of um, indemnities and insurances are we gonna get for these kinds of, um, of travel? And don't get me wrong, I am 180%, I'd be the first person to go up on, on one of those if I could afford it. Um, and I think it's fabulous because if we look back, you know, every, everyone makes this parallel back to when um, aviation was just being born. It was very expensive to fly. Um, and so the more tourists that we get, and hopefully we can protect them and figure out the best way to return and rescue them if need be, the, the more the cost of space, space flight will go down and the better the chance that uh, certainly my, my children will be able to um, be space tourists. So I kept talking, I, oh, opened about how the um, Outer Space Treaty, how space law is international. So um, this article six states that nations shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities and must both authorize and supervise. So the nation is, each nation is responsible for the um, activities of its uh, nationals. So the United States is fundamentally responsible for Elon Musk and whatever SpaceX does in space because Elon Musk is an American citizen. So this is how the Outer Space Treaty and these guidelines and provisions uh, sort of uh, trickle down to individual activities. And it's also why the United States has one of the most robust licensing uh, regimes in the world. In fact, it has the most robust space licensing regime in the world because we take very seriously our obligations under Article 6. And so we have um, the FAA uh, launch license process is, is, I can't see my camera. Yeah, it's like four feet of regulations. Yes, and uh, Elon Musk complains about them all the time. Absolutely. But we have to be responsible, especially now when, we're, when we have such a nascent industry, we have to protect it and we have to protect ourselves from, the, uh, from liability from other countries and um, so forth. So everything gets licensed. Um, yes, even the uh, Rhodes, Tesla Roadster that he launched um, back in uh, back a few years ago. I don't remember exactly when. Um, so this is, you know, you have to license your payload um, as well as whatever you're gonna send into space. Um, we license our space ports and there are more space ports than you would think um, uh, on, in the United States, um, and there's about 40 spaceports in development around the world. Now, it doesn't always work though. Um, the United States has one of the most robust uh, licensing processes in the world, and yet um, a private foundation, the ARC Mission Foundation, was able to send tardigrades to the moon without anybody knowing um, because it, it uh, launched with an Israeli uh, bear sheet, which was a uh, Israeli moon lander. Um, the Ark Mission Foundation told the Israelis that um, they were just going to send a commemorative disc 
Uh, it's basically a disc with all of the knowledge of Earth on it, you know, had, um, all of Wikipedia or something. Um, and at the last minute, they decided to slip in these tardigrades. Now, these went to the moon, they crash landed on the moon, and there's not that much issue because um, we're pretty sure there's no life on the moon. We're pretty sure, even though the tardigrades can last 10 years dehydrated and without, and in the vacuum of space, it's been proven, they're not going to contaminate the moon. But we are, um, we, one of the laws one of the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty says you cannot contaminate. And so if these tardigrades had gone to Mars, it could have been a real issue because it could have contaminated whatever life is there. We also had an issue um, with the Federal Communications Commission, which regulates the radio frequency. So if you send something into space, you want to talk to it, you need to get a license from the FCC. So these were uh, these little satellites um, are, were called SWARM. They're very small. And the FCC said, no, we don't want you to, you, you haven't proven to us that you can track what's where they're going and what's gonna happen with them. So we will not permit you to license. So what did Swarm do? They went to India and they launched with India. So there's still a lot of gaps in, you know, how we regulate and restrict and make, make sure we have responsible space activities. Um, Article seven um, just talks about the fact that once you launch an object into space, you are always the owner of it. You will always be liable for it. And um, the, the concept of launch isn't just if you're the one who sent it up into space. It, the launch is the, um, the actual state that launches. It's the um, state that procured the launch. So uh, if, you know, if, uh, for example, when Swarm uh, went to India, procured the launch, uh, the United States, is, because Swarm is a US company, the US is considered to have procured that launch. Um, each state from whose territory it's launched. So if you launch from New Zealand, New Zealand is also liable and the facility um, from which an object is launched. So a lot of different states are involved in this concept of uh, launching state. Um, we do have a liability convention, which says if your object does damage to anything on earth, you are absolutely liable. Doesn't matter if it was your fault or not. If your object, if you launch something into space, it comes down. Um, it hits something on earth and it damages it, you're absolutely liable, no questions asked. So recently we just had the Chinese um, spacecraft uh, return to earth. Uh, thankfully it landed um, near the Maldives, but a lot of consideration about what if it hits New York? What if, so this is the treaty that takes care of that. Um, if you do damage to another object in space, so space to space damage, then you have a liability standard. Um, so the problem with this convention is it, it's, it's not, used properly. So back in 1978, uh, the Russians launched, a, the Soviet Union launched a satellite um, containing a nuclear, a nuclear uh, cell, I guess. Um, it uh, didn't work properly and it tumbled out of orbit and it um, crashed uh, across the Northwestern territories of Canada, um, leaving particulates as small as the one you see um, of nuclear waste uh, all across Canada. Canada went to uh, the Soviet Union and said, okay, you owe us this money for cleanup. Um, I think they asked for 12 million Canadian, uh, did not invoke the liability convention. Ultimately it was settled. Um, I think the Russians ended up paying, the Soviet Union ended up paying just two, $2 million for the cleanup. Um, again, though, think about the politics of it. Um, what was the first state to, to run and help Canada was the United States. Um, we got a lot of intelligence of understanding how advanced or not advanced the Soviet Union's space program was by being able to um, inspect their rubble. Um, in 1990, uh, 2009, um, a privately owned satellite um, collided with a, well, no, a defunct Russian satellite collided a US, with a US commercial satellite owned by Iridium. Um, the, this created a debris, uh, cloud, but didn't bring, didn't cause any damage on earth. So again, the uh, liability convention was not invoked and the, um, the, this was settled privately. So we don't have any sort of um, precedent to understand how, how to deal with that. Um, and, uh, you know, the other problem that we talk about two satellites colliding, um, then you create a debris field, right? Um, the Chinese ASAT test of 2000 created this debris field that you see going around. And these are little pieces of debris um, that are just sort of all around the earth. And the, there's a, um, a uh, 
theory called the Kessler syndrome that says, okay, every time you have all these pieces, they can um, hit other pieces and make even more pieces. And the concern is that very soon, we're not gonna be able to get out of our own orbit because everything, every time we launch, we're going to hit something, some of that debris. And that is, can be catastrophic. So this, the debris travels very quickly um, and you can see the damage it can do. Um, this was in the lab um, with um, you know, steel, um, but if we're talking about solar arrays and solar panels, uh, communications equipment, um, even a little tiny piece of debris can really, uh, can, can completely destroy a satellite. Um, so for example, in terms of, you know, a lot of people will say, tell you, you know, space is very big. Uh, you don't have to worry. Um, the debris is very far apart. And that's true. We're, we're not literally going to hit debris every time we launch, but um, in 2020, uh, space station had to move four times to avoid debris. So this is really a growing problem. And um, what does that mean? I, brought, I bring it up under the liability convention because when we're talking about like the Chinese ASAT test, the US Air Force does a very good job of uh, tracking a lot of this debris. Um, so often we can sort of pinpoint where debris might've come from, but often we can't. And so there's no incentive even to like be clean up your debris because um, if, it were to hit, if, if it were to hit something else, we might not ever know, we might not even know why um, a satellite was damaged. Um, you know, we're not going up there all the time um, repairing things. So this concept of liability is really, it's a nice idea, but very difficult and very to enforce and very difficult to sort of get your arms around. Um, Article eight talks about registering space objects. And this, this is something that the United States is looking very carefully at because right now it just says you have to um, register any object you launch into orbit. So for example, um, the uh, launch of the Saturn V, which took uh, Apollo 11 to the moon. Um, on the registry, on the international registry, it just says the Saturn V was launched into orbit. It doesn't say um, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. So the international registry of objects in space does not include um, this, the Apollo 11, uh, the Eagle. Um, and so this is a question of retaining jurisdiction and control. Um, this is the attempt to make sure that we can track objects, but it was created, obviously wasn't created at that point to do that. It was created more of a responsibility, um, you know, or, or the, if, if you launch something, nobody else can take it down. It would be um, taking away their own, their property and their object. And there's an entire convention um, on the registration of objects. Um, this is what the registry looks like. Um, and you can see the other problem with the registry, this is with the United Nations, is you don't have to track, you don't, you know, orbits aren't, <clears throat> don't stay perfect forever. They're always, they're constantly changing. And even the smallest change can affect where a satellite or where a piece of, piece of debris is going. So our registration provisions are very, very old fashioned um, and not able to keep up with the reality of what's going on right now. Um, Article nine is really the, the one uh, that counters the concept of freedom of exploration and use. It's the only um, real sort of uh, narrowing of that provision. And it says, um, you're gonna conduct your activities in outer space with due regard to the corresponding interests of all other states parties. So due regard, what does that mean? Um, it, it, it means common sense, it means respect, it means consideration, right? Well, not to lawyers, uh, lawyers, decided to create this entire balancing test. And you look at the extent of the regard required by the convention depends on the nature of the rights held by the first state against the second state and blah, blah, blah. I'm a lawyer and it, and it drives me bananas. Um, so what does it mean do regard? What does it mean if you are um, have a, a mining operation on the moon? What does do regard mean? Um, I'm just go back for a sec because the other important part of this um, article nine is that you will avoid the harmful contam contamination of other planets and also adverse changes in the environment of Earth. So this is our um, prime directive provision, right? Um, avoid harmful contamination of other planets. I talked about sending the tardigrades to the moon. If you had sent the tardigrades to Mars, that would have been considered a harmful contamination. Um, I always bring up with due regard the boot prints. So a lot of people say, okay, um, the United States has those objects on the moon. Soviet Union has those objects on the moon. 
Um, those are their objects. We saw that from the space treaty. If, if, you know, if you launch something into space, it's, it remains your property and jurisdiction. Um, and so I could, I'm an art, I'm a, I'm a good lawyer. I could make an argument that if you, if you went up and moved the Eagle or, or took the, uh, took, took the messages of peace or something, um, that's U.S. property. But what about the boot prints? They're not property. They can't be property. And what does it mean to have due regard for a boot print? How colossally uh, tragic it would be if we'd lost, you know, those boot prints. Like to, you know, I, I want my children to see them. They're so inspiring. Um, and they are unprotected by anything under any, any kind of law. Um, the uh, Article 9 also says you have to um, have an international consultation if you think you're going to cause harmful interference. So this is really important because it doesn't say you can't cause harmful interference with somebody else. It says you have to have an international consultation um, before, you before you cause that harmful interference. And what is harmful interference? So um, I use this Apollo 12. Apollo 12 landed very close to about 300 yards from uh, Surveyor 3, which was a robotic mission, a US robotic mission to the moon. And the Apollo astronauts actually brought a piece of Surveyor back to Earth with them. And when, it got in, when they got back to the scientists and the geologists, they noticed that it was pitted um, and they determined it was pitted by the landing of Apollo 12, 300 meters away the regolith was able to damage Surveyor 3. So what is harmful interference then? If you have a, if you have a mining operation on the moon, if you have some, um, some scientific equipment on the moon, and you know that landing 300 meters away can cause pitting and uh, uh, anything, some, whatever, to operational materials, what, how are you gonna bound that? Um, and so I think you know, we need to have some sort of safety zone um, but we need to be very realistic about them because we also have people who are going to say, oh, I need a 20 kilometer safety zone because I have really, really, uh, you know, delicate instruments. So this is something we need to figure out um, as an international community. Harmful contamination, planetary protection. Um, when the Tesla, when Elon Musk um, launches Tesla Roadster, um, he did not put it through uh, sterilization process. And that made a lot of scientists really mad. The concept of planetary protection is based on the idea that in order to understand where life came from, um, we need to understand, you know, where it might be found, how it's found um, someplace else. There's uh, tons of writing. Um, again, the concept of the prime directive. Um, if there are living amoeba on Mars, should we be doing something that could harm them? Um, or Europa, or you know, what what is our responsibility to other life forms, whatever or however simple they might be, and and if it, even if it's not life forms, if there were life forms, you know, understanding how life began is one of the most important things when we think about planetary protection. Um, I would say, and and I've got another picture of a tardigrade that I'll share with you. I would say that. Um, we need to think beyond just the formation of life. We're looking at the moon and we have those beautiful pictures from Andrew um, showing the, the eclipse of the moon, but we don't wanna ruin our moon either, just the visual uh, beauty of it. And so we really, we, there's nothing protecting that landscape on the moon right now. Um, and that's something we really need to think about when we think about uh, exploring and utilizing space responsibly. Um, planetary protection goes both ways. Um, the Apollo, I think 11, uh, 12 and 14 uh, were quarantined. Um, and actually the law that said they had to be quarantined was not, um, was not uh, rescinded until uh, 1991. Um, it was called extraterritorial exposure. Um, so filling in all those blanks, we have the Artemis Accords, which have been signed by uh, 11, uh, nine countries. Um, and what do they do? They've been, they, they, they basically mirror um, everything, most of the provisions of the um, Outer Space Treaty. And I won't go through this um, uh, in detail. Um, I can let you have um, access to my slides. Um, but they are filling in the gaps. This is the first um, so, sort of concrete um, initiative we've had to fill the gaps in um, the international treaty that I just walked you through. So one thing is that it talks about interoperability. And this, is, this isn't even mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty, but it should be because it's how, how you can enhance collaboration. 
if we're going to have two bases from two different countries or two different groups of countries um, on the moon, well, you know, it'd be pretty tragic if they couldn't help each other in, in the, in the um, face of a disaster. With respect to Section 10 space resources, um, we already talked about the fact that the United States in 2015 made its position very clear to the rest of the world that we believe if you mine it, you own it. Um, and so that's Section 10 talks about the extraction of space resources, again, in a manner consistent with the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and Section 11 talks about deconfliction of activities. It talks about safety zones. So it's starting to tease out this concept of due regard and, and what does that mean and how are we going to figure out what these safety zones are gonna look like. Um, section nine is my favorite part of the Artemis Accords. Um, it is actually, the For All Mankind is very proud to be a, uh, a force in making sure these were in the Artemis Accords. Um, it's the first time we've had a, uh, any, any type of international agreement that recognizes there are places um, in outer space that deserve the same kind of protection as cultural heritage here on earth. And I like to put these two together, that footstep in Tanzania, which is believed to be one of the first instances uh, of evidence of humans moving from uh, being uh, walking on four feet to walking on two feet. Uh, think about the implications of that and think about how important that moment was. That was a, a moment in our common human ancestry. Um, without, without some humanoid you know, standing up on two feet, whether it was to run after a child or for whatever reason, start, start walking on two feet. Without that innovation, that curiosity, that perseverance, we wouldn't have that boot print on the moon because in order to, you know, what did it mean to stand up on two feet? It freed up our hands to carry things so we could move around and, 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 and explore um, and evolve. It allowed us to make tools. It allowed us to start to draw, to think, to, to write, to uh, discover math. Um, and so that, that was sort of the dawn of humanity. Um, and then the boot print doesn't happen without all of the centuries of history of all of humanity. It doesn't happen unless one of our common ancestors stands up on two feet. It doesn't happen unless somebody discovers math. It doesn't happen without Galileo. So that boot print, However, that blueprint is, the, um, is, is what I call in the cradle of our spacefaring civilization. That is the greatest, that is the memorial of the greatest technological achievement um, humans have ever uh, accomplished. Um, how tragic it would be to lose that blueprint. But it's not just about sort of the history. Heritage unites. Cultural heritage reflects the life of the community, its history, its identity. Um, preservation helps to rebuild broken communities protecting heritage um, builds kinship. And so what do we need when we look at space? We need that collaboration, we need that kinship. We know that we are better the more diverse we are. We know that we innovate better with the diversity and with that collaboration. Protecting heritage makes us look back and realize that all of the things that we've done um, as, we, as we've grown as humans are accomplishments that we've all built on. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and we will always be standing on the shoulders of giants and we don't wanna erase their boot prints. Um, and this, vis this picture is from messages of peace that were sent with Apollo 11, um, a disc size of a half dollar has messages of, um, from 74 nations. Um, it's sitting on the moon right now. Every single one of those messages to a one talked about peace and kinship. This is what space can do for us. Um, and this is why we need to protect our history in space to assure that we allow space to do that for us. Um, so I like to end just with this picture of our earth. Um, the um, a Japanese astronaut once told me, um, you know, the farther away you get from earth, the closer you realize we are. And I, that is what space does for us. I think that you, you all see it um, when, you, when you look at the skies together um, and certainly, you know, the pictures of the moon, um, space, space really unites um, and, and we really need to build the laws to help make sure um, that it can do so. Um, and that's for all mankind. And I'm happy to answer any questions. If anybody's still awake. <laughs> oh. oh no, that's great. Yeah, we're great. Can I ask a question that, that may be slightly off topic? I know we were talking about the, the 
near and practical current space and the treaties and stuff have have you given thought to laws let's say if elon musk actually does get a colony on mars and uh, how we might start to operate out there absolutely i actually just wrote a column about this for the ad astra magazine at the national space society so you know he is a u.s national and when you think about mars um it's not going to be instant. He's not going to be able to land on Mars and say, okay, we're free, good, you know, good riddance, everybody else in the world. They're going to be tethered to the, to the earth for some time. And so it's while that, that tether period, um, we're going to, whatever laws uh, apply to the national, well, let's just assume it's Elon Musk, U.S. laws are going to apply to him and to the people that are in his community. Um, and sure, those are going to start um, evolving and changing as they should, um, but it's going to have to be from the community there. And the, and what we're talking about at um, what we're doing at Mississippi is making sure that um, we arm the, those people, those communities, with the things they need to make sure that they become not utopias, but so they don't become company towns, right? So you know we require a right to communication, so that anybody that goes uh, to Mars with Elon Musk has the right to communicate with their family back on Earth. You know those kinds of controls. And people who are worried, who think, how do I say this? Um, some, the, some in Washington, for example, will say um, the problem with China becoming an ascending power is that they have a very different belief and legal system than mm -hmm. we do. And if China gets to Mars first, then will the Martians be living in a Chinese regime. And, you know, is that good or bad? I don't know. But that is that is something that keeps a lot of people awake at night. Well, thank you. Um, Other questions? I have a quick question. Uh, so so you mentioned a lot about the debris in space, which is a big concern. And there's a lot of incentive, um, although it may not be possible yet, but there's incentive to clean it up. Um, so could could a private company or maybe even a nation legally clean up the debris of a satellite that belong to another private company or nation? You, I mean, you, absolutely not. That's a great question. Um, you can, the, that even though it's debris, that is still an object launched by a certain nation. So one of the biggest issues we have um, is that uh, even if you can, even if we do have a company that is ready, willing and able and funded to get that, you have to get permission of the nation that sent it there. Um, and there's tremendous distrust right now between uh, China, uh, Russia, and the United States. Nobody wants anybody else to get close to their objects. Um, there are, I actually, Andrew, don't think there is a lot of incentive to clean up. Um, you know, there's no, we don't have laws that say, we, we've seen that that liability convention doesn't have a lot of teeth in terms of when these collisions happen. Um, we had, India had an ASAT test two years ago um, you know, creating a debris field. Um, we really need to get, get stronger about, um, you know, ASAT tests, you know, we shouldn't have any more of those. Um, but we also need to start incentivizing companies to not create debris, to, to, to bring their stuff out of orbit. I think, um, you know, the one thing about uh, Starlink is that they will deorbit very quickly. Um, but no, this is, this is an area, you, you're absolutely right in terms of um, we're looking at trying to use maritime law, you know, salvage law, um, but there's a lot of very sensitive equipment up there, um, and we're going to have to um, figure out how to how to manage that. In in relation to that question, is there the notion of like there is on the sea of flotsam and jetsam, and you know, things that have been abandoned, things that have been I no. Don't... So the, the Outer Space Treaty is very clear. Um, once you launch an object into space. You are the owner and have personal have jurisdiction over that object. Um, you cannot, you literally cannot abandon an object in space under current law. I'm, I'm curious about this notion of uh, liability for if two satellites collide, whose fault is it? Huh. Well, I know we can't really send investigators up to figure it out, right? But I mean, you know, suppose they, but they were just both on a collision trajectory. Is it whoever was launched last is responsible to send their their vehicle so it doesn't hit anything else, or or is there they, the law even clear about this notion of uh, liability for a collision in space? 
there is no clarity. I mean, I think think about it um, as an as a lawyer. I could argue, yes, it, it, um, I was there first. Um, you saw me. It was your responsibility to avoid me. Um, but the lawyer for the other company is going to say your orbit was wobbly and was unpredictable, and you should have been clearer about where, where you were going and what you were gonna do. That's why that registry is so important. We have that um, UN uh, registry, which right now you just sort of say, oh, this is where I'm going. Um, but we we are really, the United States is working on a strict space traffic management system. It's been, um, uh, it, it's the concept started on, in the Trump administration. It was gonna go be um, set up by the Commerce Department. Um, a lot of politics got involved, so we aren't any closer. But but that is that is definitely one of the things we really have to get. Um, it, we have to let people know where we are and where we're going, and we have to do it responsibly. Because you're right; otherwise, um, we're just going to have a lot of lawyers making a lot of money. We got an interesting question in the chat. Um, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one of them is, has there been any serious discussion as to who should represent Earth if we were to engage an extraterrestrial civilization? So um, my understanding is it's the um, secretary, the head of the um, UN Office of Outer Space Affairs, who is Simonetta de Pippo. Um, she, she is the uh, liaison with aliens, if you will, at this point. So that, that there, is, there has been serious discussion how many people actually agree that that is the one uh, is that, you know, it's funny when I was preparing for this, um, this talk tonight, I was, I would remembered a, a picture of take me to your leader. Um, and I was going to try and find a picture of Simonetta and I, you, nobody would have gotten it, but um, there's a lot of things out there joking about who is your leader. And it's, it's very, you know, obviously we're in the United States and I, um, yeah, it's definitely um, uh, the United Nations. Uh, there's another question is, has, has any of the space law made it into the code of federal regulations? Yes, absolutely. The, um, there is an entire, uh, I'm, not, I'm not as familiar with procurement law, there is an entire FAR for Space Force. Um, and so, you know, what, what are you looking at in terms of FARs? Um, you're looking at um, liabilities, um, cybersecurity, um, things, you know, what, what, what the United States has to do is prevent um, its satellites from hitting somebody else or creating that liability. Um, and so that's what you were going to see trickling down into the FARs. A question, uh, Apollo 13, we returned the land to Earth, which it wasn't designed to do, and it landed in the Pacific. Had there been a environmental problem, does international law say that we are not responsible for that? I mean, there were radioactive material on that on the limb. And I was just wondering, but, you know, like the one with the Russian land hit Canada. Uh, we would absolutely, if, if there had been a radiation issue, um, we absolutely would have been responsible for the cleanup for it. Okay. I have a, a question regarding um, the right to do something and the ability to do something. It's something that we've seen uh, with COVID, with maritime law. Sailors have a right to leave ship in most cases, but they don't have the ability. So there were a number of sailors who were stranded on ship out to sea for quite a long time. Um, what's how is that going to be codified into space law? That's exactly what we're working on right now. Um, you know, this is this is the kind of thought that um, the I've been actually looking at the cruise ship regulations um, and how things are treated and and. Um, have been doing research into the law of the sea because so many horrible things happen at sea and, and that's like on our planet, um, how easy it would be to, to uh, have those same kinds of abuses. So no, I think we're gonna have to be very clear and very strict um, in those employment contracts, you know, space, space needs labor lawyers um, and, and talk about what rights um, spacefarers, whether they're tourists or, um, you know, hotel maitre d's, um, what their rights and are and what the company's obligations are to them. And so that looking at that, that kind of law, that ability is going to be really important. And then I guess maybe a recourse uh, to where we stand right now. What's, or excuse me, a follow-up. What's actually the recourse right now if somebody breaks space law? How, how is that handled? So just like most anything international law, it's, you know, 
Bag your finger, name and shame, shame on you. You shouldn't have done that. Look at China. You know, the, the problem with our liability convention is that um, countries don't fear what the implication would be. Um, China did not take the time and invest the money necessary to make sure that its spacecraft wouldn't fall um, somewhere on Earth uh, other than, you know, and the, there's a spacecraft graveyard in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so there's no incentive to sort of be better um, in China because they also don't care about their own nationals. Um, mm -hmm. So this is this is a real issue in terms of, of enforcement. Now, um, name and shame and wagging your finger works pretty well in international law right now. Um, I think that um, what we're gonna see is that we're gonna see more commercial players. Um, and again, the, the US has very robust regulations and the, the hope is going to be that uh, other countries follow those robust regulations so we can have the trickle down at the national level. Michelle, let me ask you, what's the point of all this if nothing can be enforced? I mean, obviously the biggest player here is China. I, mean, I don't care if the other country, small countries abide by the rules. That's, you know, this looks to me like, you know, they don't care about themselves. Why should they really care? They're not going to care about us. They don't care about their own people. How can any of this be realistic? Why are we wasting our time going down this avenue? So, because, uh, boy, that's a pessimistic question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a good one. So, um, you know, we have created, since the Treaty of Westphalia, we've created this, you know, paradigm of sovereignty and of always working together, you know, um, and relating to each other on a sovereign basis. So my belief is actually that um, people have forgotten that laws are made to um, uh, govern relationships between people. You know, states are creations of law, not vice versa. So I personally want to see two different moon bases on the moon, one with Russia, China, one with the Artemis allies, because you know what? I think they're going to get along really well. Um, and they're going to be individuals who realize, oh, these are human relationships. Who really cares? I mean, we, Frank White and the overview effect, right? Everybody who has gone into space has looked down and said, wow, there's no borders. And they've had some sort of, you know, uh, ephemeral experience. Um, everyone to one has, come, you know, Edgar Mitchell has the great line, you know, get those sons of bitches up here so that they can see, you know, what we're grappling with. I really think um, that in, in a sense, you're right. There's this like, what are we doing? Um, the and the Chinese have done an incredible job in the United Nations of bringing a lot of developing countries onto their team, if you will, right? Um, because they've, they're just giving away money. Um, that's the bottom line, is the money. Is the I money. mean, uh, uh, that's, I think, the only way any enforcement of any laws that we make can be, uh, can be controlled, I guess. I mean... So I have very high hopes for the Artemis Accords um, because I think that if we can take them and bring developing countries in with us, that that's going to be the answer. But I honestly, I think the real answer is um, commercial space. We're, we're the people, you know, Elon Musk is going to get to Mars before a sovereign nation, you know, and um, I think that we have a better chance of creating uh, commercial agreements, you know, like the, um, the, like get a bunch of commercial operators together to agree, we're going to do these things because you, you want standards for your investors, right? If you know, sure. if you know that, um, uh, how much, uh, if, if Musk and Bezos know how much each other are charging, you know, then, it, then it's easier, right? You have, you can create not, it's hard with antitrust, antitrust. Laws, but, um, but yeah, I, I think the fact that we're going to have a very strong commercial space is is going to be the is going to be the thing that that breaks this sovereign paradigm back. Yeah, I just think we need to be flexible enough to expect the unexpected. I mean, <laughs> it just seems you know it, it, to predict everything. Yeah, we can prepare for the worst. You know, hope for the best, but you know we don't want to forget to prepare for the worst. You know, we don't want to lose control over our own endeavors, right? Let China do what they want to do. But, you know, how, like, for example, this last this spacecraft that they left derelict and it just crashed into the earth. What if it crashed in my house? Who cares? China don't care. 
nothing's going to happen. Why are there laws? That's my question. I mean, if they can't be enforced, so maybe there's a different way we can approach this. So uh, I think it benefits if, everybody because you know the China. You just said yourself the Chinese don't care if the shit falls on their own uh, land. Forget ours. I think and you're that, right when you said that. I think that um, sadly, um, as happens so often, you know, when um, when something happens, there will be a reaction. So the international community isn't strong enough yet to really do anything, or they're not. They don't have the will to. But if it if it were to fall on your house, um, I, I, I think something would happen. Yeah, it would be dead. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it would be dead, but it would be for the greater good. Okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> All right, I have more questions, but you know, I'm sure more people. So moved. Do we have a second? <laughs> no, go ahead, um, M Michelle. I I have one more question, really quick, and I and I think a lot of people here will be interested. So, there are pros and cons to Starlink. And I think a lot of people on this call will look more to the cons than the pros. Um, is there anything regulating how bright or how disruptive to observational astronomy? Um, are, are there any laws to that? Because I think Starlink, I think Elon Musk came out that in order to better control like the thermal properties, they're going to have to make them even brighter, which which is which can have terrible repercussions to observational astronomy from the Earth. So, is there any? Are there any laws? pertaining to it, it, it's a real, how can you place a number on that, right? Kind of kind of problems. Are there any laws pertaining to how bright things are that they can put into orbit? There are no laws about how bright things are. And um, actually the United States is the only country in the world that has a law that says you can't put advertising in space. Um, <laughs> and, and for example, you think about um, in New Zealand Rocket Lab sent that disc into space that you know sparkled for a couple months and then came back down. Um, so no, there are no laws right now, but I'm delighted to tell you, um, we've just formed a working group, um, both at the national level to inform the uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We had our first meeting this week to talk about that balance between the pros and cons and what, what, it, what we can do to, um, to find the right balance. And so um, it's acad academia and industry, um, and our job is to um, prepare plan for uh, Congress. Um, and so we, we literally had our first meeting and, and one of the first thoughts was, um, well, do we consider orbit part of the environment? Is that one way to regulate? You know, so how, how do we reach it? Um, and then once we figure out legally how we reach it, then, then what do we do with it? Um, and, and hopefully we strike a good balance. Great, thank you. Hey, Andrew, do you think, I don't know if there's any credit to what I'm saying here is if the satellites, the Starlink satellites are in a higher orbit, they would be less bothersome. We wouldn't be able to see them. Well, um, if you put them in a higher orbit, they may not be as bright per se, but they'll be visible from a larger region of the earth. Right. Right. But they'll get you know they're only visible from a very um, specific region closer to the equator. You get the more visible they are. But um, if you put them in a higher orbit, they'll be visible from more latitudes. Right. So. Right. I mean, right now we have a zillion satellites out there and we only see, you know, a few of them that were close to Earth. I don't know how theoretically how far away that Elon Musk can. Well, I, I don't want to take I don't, we, we can talk about it later. I want to take questions away from. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. It, it, you, in photographs, as you notice, the amount of satellites that you can see is exponentially. Yeah. Bigger. I mean, they're a pain in my butt. Yes. So. Yeah. Well, if they're higher up, you can also see them for a longer time after sunset. But if they're dimmer, they're easier to deal with. Yeah. But I, I think part of the thing about Starlink is they want to provide very, very low latency internet access. So putting them in higher orbits would defeat that purpose. Right, right. right. Yeah. So in other the case, they're only going to go up to 550 miles at max. So that's not very far at all. Uh, I was just trying to find an answer because I hate those things. But you also have deorbiting issues too, because a higher orbit has a lot longer lifetime, right? So you got to deal with all of the stuff for a lot longer before re-entry. Michelle, fix this stuff for us, would you? I'm working on it. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'll, report, ago, I'll report back in, a, in, in November, yeah. Some time ago, my brother gave me a gift and apparently I own property on the moon. But what <laughs> you're telling me is I guess I don't really own any property on the moon. Yeah, no, you don't. 
Oh, uh, Mark, I thought we were going on vacation. He, he also bought you shares in a bridge to Brooklyn. Any other questions? I just see the, where do the countries that do not sign one of these agreements fit in? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a real concern. Um, the United Nations um, Office of Outer Space Affairs is working really hard to convince countries to sign. Um, but there is a concern um, as, as we have in the high, you know, flags of convenience. Um, you know, right now, every, every country that is capable of being spacefaring um, other than North Korea um, have signed the Outer Space Treaty. So. so I guess following up to that, what happens if somebody goes to outer space and then declares themselves their own country? Great question. I mean, again, you know, you look at um, if it's if it's a if it's a national that is not from uh, a nation that is a member to the Outer Space Treaty, they can do that. And there's actually there is a, a movement called Asgardia. Um, they've declared themselves a nation, and they are going to build. They built their first CubeSat. They plan on building. Uh, an orbital something, and they've already declared that they're going to make it their own nation. Um, and there are there are international laws about um, how you become a nation and when you will be recognized as a nation by the United Nations. Um, but you know, when I think about Mars, for example, um, is Mars even going to want to be a member of the UN? Maybe not. Um, so yeah, that's that 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 is a, a very real possibility, oh. and there are people trying to do it. Well, I like your your idea to my original question, which is the notion that, by definition, this stuff isn't happening overnight, you know. Right. And so, uh, no matter what happens, just like it happens in the rest of the world, we will have some accommodation, right? And then, of course, the realities of the thing will have effect too, you know. If you can affect things on other uh, other planets, such as Mars, uh, you know, uh, we have no lack of evidence that such stuff happens in the world today so and if it's hard to affect then maybe there'll be less a uh, uh, incentive for third parties to mess around with it but that's definitely in the future the the uh, analog of antarctica occurred to me uh, before you got to it in your presentation i wondered if you had any more comment i, I was kind of my takeaway was things are a bit more buttoned up in the antarctica treaty even though it's older I would have expected maybe we would have learned from our experience in, in sort of litigating Antarctica that things would be more buttoned up. But I guess maybe the uh, conflicts of interests related to some of these laws maybe prevented that from happening in space? So the, there's two things. Um, first of all, Antarctica is a really flawed treaty because um, they didn't agree to anything. They just agreed to not argue about it anymore. So they, we've made no decisions about uh, the territorial claims that are made to Antarctica. We've just agreed that we're not going to talk about them for another 20 years. Um, and so, you know, that's not something we can take to space with us. The other thing, you know, there's, there's never been a treaty about Antarctica that says you cannot claim sovereignty over it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, Antarctica <coughs> is finite. You know, it's, there's not, there, we know exactly how much of it there is. And so I, I, would like to sort of separate, you know, space is infinite. It truly is. Sure, we can't get to all of it. Um, but, you know, when we think about how we want to uh, regulate activities on the moon, that's very different from how we want to regulate activities on some asteroid that somebody found, right? Um, so it, it just, space is just, there's more there there. Um, so we have to think about it differently. I'm, I'm just curious, and, and I'll ask a legal question. Uh, I'm just curious how much of the disparity and the um, disconnects in the lattice work of laws is a function of the various nations' different evolutions of law. For example, French is, is a Napoleonic code and the United States has developed co common law. England has even older common law. And I guess the Eastern European nations have sort of a mishmash of both. H how much of the difficulty in assembling a latticework of laws is a function of the fact that the nations each come to law, the concept of law from a different viewpoint? 
That's a really interesting question. I think it's um, the, yeah, there's sort of the prescriptive um, and it's sort of the philosophy of law, uh, you know, and if you look at laws in, in, in Asian regions, then things are very communal. Um, and here in, in the United States, it's much more independent. Um, but in space, um, I don't think it's been driven by those differences um, so much. It's been driven by ideology, for sure. You know, for example, the Soviet Union didn't want to concede that anybody, private, commercial, would ever get to space. They, they wanted to ban commercial activity in space altogether. Um, I think what we're seeing in space is um, just we agreed on what we could agree on. And the most important thing at the, in 1967 was um, we didn't want the Cold War to um, expand into orbit. So we wanted to keep peace. That's why the, the committee that was formed is the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. That was the fundamental um, uh, mission of the original negotiators. And that's why we have what we have. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? No, but this is an awesome talk. Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you so much for coming. I'm so glad I caught that piece um, because it's been fascinating. I actually did try to tackle space law. <sighs> when the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast launched with, I think it was 2006, 2008, a long time ago, I actually did about a five minute podcast on space law such as it had evolved at that point and just digging in down as as far as that for five minutes was a hard chore so speaking for an hour i could that just blows me away that was great i really appreciate it um well, well thank you and thank you for listening i am very passionate about space law i would love to come back and talk about for all mankind um when, if you guys would have me whenever um or or you know we a q a session just answering questions um i love it so i really appreciate all of you staying on late on a Friday night. No, sure. Maybe. And actually, could do you want to give a plug for For All Moonkind? I, I think um, the, you know, the, um, we talk about uh, all these missions to the moon um, and we, you know, we really sort of did it at the end of my um, presentation, but um, that, that boot print, represents um, so many lives, you know, the 400,000 people that worked on the Apollo missions, but um, all of the people all around the world who supported the missions, all of the people throughout history and centuries who, who figured out uh, physics and math and astronomy, um, none of that, none of, none of those boot prints would be on the moon without them. And I just think it's criminal that we can't have a law that protects those blueprints the same way we protect things like Stonehenge or the or the the first footprints in Lytoli, Tanzania. Um, and so, if you um, you can go to our website for allmoonkind.org. Um, I put the you, link on the and chat. you put the donations right in there. Thank you. Yeah, we are we um, we are using the money. We have um, if you go on to um, for all mankind moon registry, we've created um, the first open source, open to the public, um, free. Um, registry of every single human item on the moon. Um, and this is a resource we're making available for free. Um, we had a lot of people donating their time to find this stuff, find information about this stuff. Um, if you know about any of this stuff, if you can, you know, you can email me and tell me we're just looking for details. And the, the concept is to make people realize that everything that is on the moon um, is, an, is, a, is a celebration of human achievement. Um, and a little girl in Alabama should be as proud of it as a little girl in Ghana or a little boy in Indonesia. That, that's our human heritage and we need to embrace it. Cool. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Um, we, uh, does anybody have anything else for the good of the order? Uh, yeah, Harold, can I, can I just take the moment to, to give a virtual round of applause to Jeremy for finding these great talks during this during this time, because Jeremy is, I don't think people realize how hard Jeremy's job is. 
I definitely wouldn't want to do it. And he's definitely taken advantage of the circumstances and found great talks from people who might not have been able to make it otherwise if we were still doing in person. So he's really been pretty innovative with finding these amazing talks. I, I think after every single meeting, everyone says how great they are. So I just want to take the time to, to personally thank him and, and ask that everybody just give Jeremy a, a round of applause. So thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks. A Andrew, Thanks. I'm pissed that I didn't think of that's an awesome sentiment. I wish I would have thought of it first. <laughs> as much as I love to take credit, I have to you know, acknowledge a lot of people who've helped me in finding speakers too. You know, Harold has made some suggestions. Al Lamperti has made a few suggestions recently. So uh, I certainly need to share uh, credit for that. And you know, we are thinking in the future, even after we're meeting in person, of maybe having some speakers come in from a distance as well. Now, not all the time, but maybe once in a while, if we can get a, you know, a different speaker or a different subject on something that would be really interesting. I'd like to get the uh, the guy who's driving the Tesla that uh, Elon Musk shot into space, but I don't know if he's available. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Isn't there some kind of law protecting him? <laughs> he's, he's booked up. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, that being the case, um, Jeremy,